24 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Rituraj Sinha, Group Managing Director from SIS Limited. Thank you, and over to you, Mr. Sinha. Hello, everyone. This is Rituraj. Uh, thank you for joining this call, and I welcome all of you. I would like to take this opportunity to also introduce my colleague, Vineet Tosniwal. Vineet joins SIS as president for MA and investor relations. And he's also going to be a part of the group managing committee. Uh, Bharat has uh, moved out. Interesting set of experience. And uh, he has been involved in multiple MNAs in this particular industry itself, in his previous stint as an investment banker with Equus, he also has held PNL positions with Infosys, and more recently was uh, involved in the fintech space. So overall, uh, it's a, it's a great addition to the SIS family to have somebody with we need expertise, experience, and reputation as part of our team. I would hand the call over to Vineet to conduct this uh, discussion. Uh, thank you, Vitraj, uh, and I'm very happy to be part of SIS family. Uh, so uh, look forward to connecting with all of you on the call over the next few quarters. Uh, currently, I'm based in Mumbai. Uh, and I intend to relocate uh, to Delhi uh, over the next couple of months. Um, I hope uh, you've all had a chance to look at our results and earnings note, which has been uploaded uh, on the stock exchanges and the company website as well. Uh, so let me start uh, on a happy note that we are very happy to report very strong numbers uh, this quarter. Uh, you can see that our revenue is up 6% year on year. Uh, more importantly, uh, from earnings point of view, the EBITDA is up 20% year on year. So for the first time, we crossed 150 crores of EBITDA uh, in one quarter. We have had the highest ever quarterly revenue in India security, as well as in our cash business. As a group, as you all know, we are very focused on margins, both in terms of customer contract as well as SGNA costs as well. Uh, so consolidated EBITDA margins have improved from 4.4% in the same quarter to 4.9% uh, in this quarter. Uh, the improvement is coming uh, from margins uh, in our India security business, where margins have improved substantially from 4.9% in the same quarter last year to pre-COVID levels now. Uh, of 6.1% this quarter, uh, which is a change of 120 basis points. In the international security business, we are happy to report that uh, Henderson business has achieved operational profits uh, through a combination of uh, management's relent relentless focus on cost, rationalization, uh, shredding of unprofitable contracts, and uh, new business growth as well. On the facility management side, as you're aware, this year we became the largest pure play FM company in India. Uh, we are continuing to witness tailwinds in the sector, uh, with demand increasing for integrated service providers. The cash business surges ahead with its superior profitability metrics, uh, with an EBITDA margin of 16.6%, a growth of over 130 basis points year on year and a tax margin of 8.6% in this quarter. The profit after tax also improved uh, over 450% year on year. So overall, we are very happy with the business momentum and particularly the increase in margins. So now let me hand over the floor uh, for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone phone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handset only while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Alok Deshpande from Nuwama Institutional Equities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, Vitraj. Uh, I believe the congratulations on good performance, especially uh, the India margins coming back. Uh, two questions from my side. Uh, one, uh, uh, are you confident now that these margins can stay above 6% sustainably uh, in the foreseeable future? That is one. And secondly, how should we look at growth in the facility management business for next year? Uh, because I uh, remember you calling out that you know, as you sort of streamline the quality of contracts there, uh, you may see some tapering down of growth. But uh, are we uh, will we still do growth which is around 14, 15 percent, 15, 20 percent? How should we look at that number? So these are my two questions. Thanks, Alok. Uh... I think as far as the security business in India is concerned, uh, as we had stated earlier, we have moved back to pre-COVID margin levels. And I think uh, 6% and beta margin broad range is sustainable. There will always be quarter to quarter fluctuations because of contract raisings and various other one-off incidents, but I think broadly 6% margin range for security services in India has been achieved. So that's good news. Uh, on facility management, I think it's going to be a longer walk. I have clearly indicated in my past calls that the facility management business in post-COVID year grew at over 30% year on year. In the process, they took on certain contracts which were flat fee contracts, uh, contracts which were actually lower margin contracts, contracts which are operationally bearing a huge amount of deductions and penalties for different instances. Uh, having said that, for the last three quarters back to back, we've been trying to uh, get rid of these contracts and correct or improve the margin situation. Now, let me explain for clarity those who may be new to this conversation. Our business, facility management or security or cash, is like a bucket of contracts. So when you take on a lot of bad contracts, you have to selectively exit contracts. Now, they are the first problem that you face there is that you cannot exit a contract at will. There are term of contracts and notice periods and various other things. So you cannot exit contracts at will. So that becomes a protracted process. The second challenge that comes is that if you hypothetically also, if you exited all bad contracts all at once, that would disrupt the profitability of branches uh, as it will be a very sharp revenue cut and obviously that would not sustain the SGNA expenses of the business. So for that reason as well, you stagger the exit. At this moment, our facility management portfolio led by Shamshir Puri is uh, ensuring that every quarter we balance the volume of new orders with the volume of bad contracts that we exit. It's not a perfect balance, but that's how we are going about cleaning our bucket of contracts. Long story short, we did the exact same thing in security. Security has come through to 6%. FM is taking a little longer. But directionally, I believe FM has in the past, pre-COVID, delivered 6% EBITDA margin. 
and whether it takes two quarters or four quarters, FM will move in that direction once we are done with our portfolio rationalization. So I hope I look that answer. Sorry for the longish answer. Uh, no, that's, right. that's very helpful indeed. Uh, just one question, if I may, uh, excuse me, one more. Uh, this is a much more longer term question regarding the solutions uh, uh, business in the security, India security part. Uh, you had mentioned in the past that, you know, as, as time progresses, uh, you know, we should stop thinking about headcount as such, right? I mean, uh, think more about the solution based approach that you guys have. Now, uh, you know, as as that happens, obviously, you know, uh, with lesser people getting added for, let's say, revenue coming from solutions, the benefits from ATVJ also would sort of go down. So, you know, when the, in the solutions business, uh, you know, is, are the margins high enough compared to the existing business which can offset that benefit of ATVJ going out at the margin? It's sort of a long-term question, but... Uh, no, no, but, but I'm glad that you brought this topic for discussion. So I believe that you should not look at this business from a headcount perspective because this is not a staffing business. This is a services business which is trying to become a solutions business and eventually the goal is to become a root-based solutions business. That's the value chain we are wanting to write. The four layers, you know, I keep talking about it. The staffing layer is least value addition. So you get a flat fee per head and you operate a 3%, 2% EBITDA margin business. The services business is a 5 6% EBITDA margin business because you are recruiting, training, you're responsible for outcomes. You are signing outcome-based contracts, not just providing inputs like staffing. So staffing is a five, six percent margin business as we have seen. Then you have the layer of solutioning where you merge digitization, automation, mechanization with uh, uh, with services to deliver outcomes. Now that becomes a higher margin business like for example, the alarms business, the EBITDA margin for SIS alarm monitoring business by and large, contract to contract differs, but we make 15% EBITDA to 20% EBITDA uh, in alarm monitoring and response business. And the ultimate layer is what you call the root-based solution business, which is basically cash logistics, where you know you ha you basically have a root productivity concept, and if you have higher density of work in a route that generates super normal margins, that business could yield up to 20% or greater EBITDA margins. So SIS is moving up that path. Now, again, long story short, uh, what happens as we build more solution-based businesses? Now, FM is already more than 25% solutioning because in most contracts they use machines and automation and stuff like that. Security, less than 10% is solution still. From a five year perspective, even as we put all our effort towards achieving higher solution, you must understand that even in Western markets, like Australia, which is a mature market, where the labor cost is amongst the highest, where the pressure to use technology could not be greater. Even in those markets, 80% of the security revenue, 85% to be more accurate, still comes from manpower services. 15% comes from beat patrols and uh, you know, all other kinds of solutions. So to answer Alok's point, even as SIS in India, in security and FM, makes a massive push for solutioning, you must understand that that is more for bringing value to customers and differentiating versus competitors. 
it is not going to be so that 90% of our revenues will come from solutions and manpower piece will only be 10%. So there will be hardly any ATJJ. That is not the way to look at it. It is for the next five years, obviously, we will look to primarily focus on solutioning. But I don't see that to constrict our manpower growth completely. Manpower will continue to grow. And till ATJJ benefits are accruing, they will continue to accrue. Thanks, thanks, Ritikar. This is very detailed and very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder to all the participants that you may press star 1 to join the question queue. The next question is from the line of Mukul Garg from Motilal Osal Financial Services. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks uh, for taking my question and uh, you know, good margin performance, Ritikar. Uh, just a couple of follow-up questions, uh, you know, from the previous participant. Uh, on the facility management side, uh, you know, is it fair to, you know, kind of view the uh, rationalization process uh, is pretty much coming towards its end now, and maybe like you know, in one to two quarters, we should, you know, start kind of focusing back on on growth, and uh, you know, margin obviously will continue to. Uh, you know, be favorable towards uh, our 6% target range? I mean, I, it's uh, nearly impossible for me to, you know, forecast an exact time frame for it, and I would not indulge in that. I think, you know, what we need to look at is that security was down below 4% of beta margin. It's an identical business to facility management in terms of portfolio management basket of contract concept. You know, the security business took a good eight quarters, but it's back to 6%. FM is on track. Whether it takes one quarter or four quarters, it's very hard to put my finger on, but trend-wise, you should be clearly able to see uh, uh, improving trend on margins in FM. That I can see very clearly. Perfect. Great. And, uh, you know, on the Australia business side, uh, you know, have have you seen the full impact of uh, the uh, you know, minimum wage revisions which happened sometime back there uh, flow into contracts or is that something which is still in process? Uh, just wanted to, you know, kind of uh, probe this from, you know, while you have, you know, spoken about in the release about, uh, you know, some investments and, and contract related changes. Uh, but uh, given the profitability there, uh, is that something you know which uh, can be a lever going forward? Yeah, look, uh, as far as uh, the minimum wage rise in Australia is concerned, we passed through all wage hikes. We are still in the process of getting the price revisions done from clients, but even that's largely now 80% complete. So I don't see any negative effects coming through as far as the Australian business is concerned on account of the minimum wage, exceptional minimum wage hike that uh, the Australian market saw this year. Uh, is there opportunity for that to move up overall as high as international margins? I'd say more likely than not because after a long gap, Henderson uh, is back into break-even marginal profit type situation. The New Zealand business is doing fairly well, generating 7-8% EBITDA margin. MSS is stabilized. SXP is the only business which is uh, going through some, they have, you know, we spoke in the past, they've lost massive volumes uh, with JB Hi-Fi and uh, one or two other such retail contracts because of insourcing, it's completely gone off. But uh, that has uh, hurt the profitability of SXP business. But uh, long story short, do I see margins going down or going up? 
more likely to go up but mind you and i want to underline this even pre covid international business was in the 4.5% ebitda margin range so as you build a margin improvement please remember that the business will improve to what level you know it it was never uh, a 6% business uh ebitda margin business uh, and that's not what it can be sure no i think that's fair and, and one last question uh, you know was on uh, the whole atgj a and the impact on taxation this quarter uh, uh, i was not very you know uh, clearly able to understand uh, was there some uh, volume pricing change which happened this quarter for uh, you guys you know being unable to take any uh, you know kind of benefit of that on uh, on your taxation side which resulted in the higher tax rate uh, can you just you know help us understand it better i'm not sure if devesh is able to join yeah Is Devish is here? Can you please take that? Yeah, uh, Devish, uh, am I audible? Yeah, Devish, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So what's happened? As you can see, uh, even the last quarter, this quarter, there's been a flat growth on the security and asset revenue in India, and uh, the net number of people has actually not increased. Uh, so what's happened is, as a result, we had to stop the accrual of the ETJJ benefit in this quarter. uh and if there's another growth in the next quarter then we will uh, accrue for the benefit as is available to us so we've taken a conservative approach we've uh, discontinued the benefit this quarter what we can see in the pnl is that the unwinding of the deferred tax benefit of the previous two years has come into the pnl so that's why you see a deferred tax expense but that is just the deferred tax asset we created in the previous years it is coming back into the pnl uh, this year so uh, the best way to look at it is without deferred tax because that gives you the current tax uh, position clear enough i think that that was clear thanks for taking my question i'll get back into the q and uh, best of luck for uh, 2024 thank you participants may press star and 1 to ask a question The next question is from the line of Ria Mehta from Equirius Investments. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, my first question is in regards to the cash logistics business. So we are seeing that uh, we have seen uh, your comment is that you have seen almost sixty percent kind of growth in Q3 FY24 on a YOI basis. So what would be the uh, brief growth in the ATM business and the non-ATM business? If you could give me that data. Well, at this point in time, we are not giving out uh, segment level uh, information yes, because you know. Sorry. Directionally, which segment do you more if you could not if you do not want to give numbers? No, so directionally, uh, look, uh, we we believe and we've had this view since uh, post demonetization. that the atm business is dying cash is not dying cash in circulation is going up but the usage of atm is going down so we we positioned our business in a way that less than 20% of our revenues comes from atm replenishment services 80% of our business is non atm linked cash logistics yes so it's very clear from our portfolio adjustment that we see a greater future in what we call boss bank outsourcing services we see that to be a future we see uh, non atm growth to be the future not atm at all for the current quarter also this holds true absolutely in fact uh, you know some numbers our uh, atm uh, count has gone down by a few hundred this quarter and honestly that doesn't make make us any difference because 
you know what we focused on is how the number of atm routes we run their density should not go down we don't want twice the number of atms and routes which have lower density we want pure atms higher density because that's how you make money so that's our view on atms okay and uh, in terms of there the commentary we said that both the devaluating options to unlock value so what could be the potential option like well to put it very straight forward sis is sis with toshigor is looking to list our uh, cash business we are evaluating options it could be through a mirror demerger it could be through some other means but uh, the idea is to list the cash company uh, at the right time okay um and my second question is in regards to uh, what will affect it segment now being a percentage in the total business sectoral it services i know for security it services are uh, around about 12% of revenue and for facility management i'd say that we slightly higher close to 14 15% of revenue 14 15% so what would be the uh, but, but i i will i will ask uh, shweta uh, to actually get back to the exact numbers because what i'm just saying top of my head i haven't seen the customer okay. segment wise revenue mix for last quarter got it got it uh and in terms of what would be the major sector which would contribute to uh, our security sector segment well, the beauty of our, of this industry you know the two three things that are beautiful about this sector is number one this is an annuity business you don't sell every month and you sell a contract it goes out for two three years so it's an annuity business like insurance the second beauty is it does not consume a lot of capital it's a low capital business and the third most beautiful thing about this business i'd say is that everybody is a customer you go to any street in any city of india no matter what's on your left or right side of the road you will see security guards standing cctv cameras if there is any kind of a building you will have to have cleaning staff and if there is a commercial establishment there will be somebody managing the cash or the banking services to that you know service point so the this business is everywhere it is not dependent on a customer not even a customer segment or a few customer segments for that matter it's a very diversified business and that is why during covid it was least impacted and the first to go back to good mm. that's the beauty of essential services right got it and uh, what would be a reprotect business right now the alarm system entire uh, what would be the revenue contribution from that so i mean it's still a very small business from a sis perspective on a on a 11 12000 crore balance sheet a 100 crore business is is not really significant but uh, in the industry in the alarm monitoring industry we protect is now the largest alarm monitoring company in india with roughly 24000 active connections so it is the largest alarm monitoring company in the country but uh, i i think this will it will close this year at ballpark uh, 100 crores of revenue by the year end yeah for fi 24 and what were the kind of growth percentage last year for the business almost double yeah, i think it's a very small base so you know it would be some 50 yeah. 70% for that and uh, going forward since we are focused on this business the interest in the depreciation cost would uh, continue to go up is my understanding right and what would it, what is the kind of break even or uh, how many years does this depreciation go on to so so if you look at our we protect business it has a 
positive EBITDA for many quarters now. It is also positive on PBT line now. So it is a profitable business and a you know independent self-funding business in its own right. Uh, they they have a mix of financing options. They do take on term loans uh, to to buy certain you know to fund certain uh, capex in certain contracts. But in other contracts, they've also gone for the leasing option where they pay out rentals, which is above the operating profit line. So I don't see them accumulating humongous amount of capex per se it would again look at the group's balance sheet even if they add like 20 30 crores of capex each year i don't think it it uh, really um, matters very significantly got it and uh, going forward are we seeing any uh traction or improvement in the staffing or the number of employees going forward? We are not in the staffing industry. I didn't follow your question. We are not in the staffing industry. I didn't follow your question. Uh, no. So maybe we are talking in terms of number of employees. So in security business as such, security and facility management, if you could guide for the growth going forward. As the business grows, the headcount will grow. Got it, got it. So we don't have any uh, forcing um, traction. No, we 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 don't comment uh, on uh, okay, what the quarter on quarter growth forecast is. Yeah. We'll have to wait for next quarter. Thank you so much. Thank you. A reminder to all the participants, please press star and one to join the question queue now. The next question is from the line of Amit Sisoria, who's an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hi, hi, good afternoon. Am I audible? Hello? Yes, sir, you're audible. Yes, yes. Hi, Rukuraj. Uh, my first question is uh, regarding the growth thing. What kind of a growth do you foresee for the next five years in our business? And how much of it is going to come through uh, wage, in, um, wage growth? And how much of it is going to come through uh, volume growth? Well, the best way to look at it is to look at the history and the journey of SIS. So SIS has rule of thumb grown more than twice GDP growth rate, somewhere between 2x to 3x GDP growth rate. That's a 20-year history. I mean, since, since uh, IPO, you have the information, but from a 20-year perspective, since I've been involved in the business, SIS has grown 2x to 3x GDP, rule of thumb. Where does that growth come from? It's almost a half and half split between volume growth and price growth. So if GDP grows 7%, SIS grows 18, 20%, half of that 9, 10% comes from price, 9, 10% comes from uh, volume. So I don't see any reason why that 20 year old, uh, you know, uh, rule of thumb should materially change in the coming quarters. In fact, I see potentially this will improve because the kind of capex that the government is putting in, the kind of capex that the private sector has started to put in, any real estate that is created, any building, any public utility, any government office, any factory, any educational institution, any hospital, you name it, whether it's an IT park or an amusement park, needs security guards, needs cameras, needs cleaning staff. That doesn't change. So more square foot constructed is greater market, greater addressable market for us. Okay. 
Rituraj, one follow-up question. Uh, like now we have become a 12,000 crore revenue company. For our company to grow 10%, it means we need to grow the revenue by about uh, 1,200 crores. And I did a rough calculation uh, where I what, uh, had an input like uh, an average uh, guard or uh, cleaning staff uh, gets a salary of 2 lakh rupee per year. So uh, going by that calculation, it comes to uh, like, uh, I came to a number uh, like we need to add 40, 50,000 uh, employees um, every year to achieve this kind of a growth. And uh, do you think like, uh, uh, do you find my calculations right? Oh, wow. Uh, I don't know your calculations, so I won't comment on that, but I'll give you some headline numbers for you to think about. The first thing to think about is, do you think that the wage, minimum wage in India, is extremely high or extremely low? I guess it's extremely low. Yeah. How do you see it evolving over the next 10 years? Do you do you see it growing at a fast clip? Because it should, it should. If the, so if the wage grows, the cost of security security guard will grow. So that's right. that's half half the price part. As far as volume is concerned, how do you see the uh, Indian economy developing? And uh, do you see developing on the back of uh, capex? or more construction uh, across more industrialization, more uh, urbanization. Uh, if you see that, then obviously the volume is also going to grow. The key thing, you know, sometimes it looks like, oh my God, you know, how do you manage that? How do you get too big? So some stats for you. SIS is the market leader in India, but our market share is barely 5%. The world key markets in the U.S. Allied Universal as the market has close to 20% market share. In UK, G4, which is now a part of Allied Universal, is the largest operator, has 20% market share. In the Scandinavian markets, Securitas is the largest operator, has more than 25% market share. In Australia where our own subsidiary is the market leader, MSS, that has 20% market share. So I think there's a massive headroom for SIS to move from 5% to 10%, 15% market share. So there's a massive headroom in India for that. And the last thing is that, you know, most people do not understand or do not recognize that the largest security company in the world is... $20 billion in annual revenues, approximately. So, if India was to have a $2 billion security company, I don't think that is so far-fetched as an idea. But that's my view. Right? And this is not a forecast. This is how I think. Okay, uh, one a little uh, small question. Like we are kind of stuck in that five percent uh, kind of a market share. What do you think uh, is going to be the trigger that moves us uh, moves us towards ten percent, fifteen percent? It's both. It's one driven by government regulation on compliance, government regulation on private security standards. It's also moved by customers getting more involved in terms of, you know, quality focus, not just cheapest price. It's also driven by execution capacity, who has the best and largest execution capacity, who has branch network across every state and can address every district's requirement, who has the largest number of training centers, who has the largest number of systems, who has a manage manager, starter. So it's also supply side. Uh, or execution side aspects. It's a whole lot of different factors that will determine, and ultimately, there is also MA. You know, there will be consolidation. Thanks, thanks for the answer. Thank you. Thank you.
the next question is from the line of Mazid Ahmed from Smart Sync Investment Advisory Service. Please go ahead. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Good set of numbers, sir. Uh, so my first question I have is: So I already also mentioned that you are planning the future, not currently, to list the cash company. And so like, and also there are other. They are competing in the cash logistic business. So, what a competitive advantage they are looking at as a company in the cash logistics segment. So, we are the second largest cash company in the country after CMS. Uh, but our strategy is materially different. CMS is 80% dependent on ATMs. Our dependence on ATMs is only 20%. So, I think long term. we have a strategy level advantage and also in terms of execution you know sis has a much broader bandwidth to execute as compared to any other competitor because you know our footprint is pan india our relationship with customers are far deeper because we provide security we provide facility management to the same banking customers our ability to recruit train and manage people is much deeper than any other competitor so i think we've got a whole lot of advantages not to mention the fact that prosigor is a world leader in cash logistics and they have implemented world class technology uh at par with the upss and fedexes of the world to manage cash in india uh with with jb which most indian companies are not able to invest in and develop on their own but we are getting benefit of you know sco and various other such uh, proprietary technology platforms of prosigo that we have implemented in india so there's a whole lot of reasons uh, but one of the big reasons also is the fact that you know we will be having uh, uh, you know almost uh, 100 crore plus ebitda in the cash logistics business as of today on sotp basis we believe that that is not assigned any meaningful value in the sis market cap simply because we don't consolidate our cash jv we are a 49% shareholder so we do equity accounting we don't consolidate the whole book and that the reason the result of that is that almost 1200 to 15 crores worth of enterprise stock equity value is getting not captured in our market cap so it we just believe that if cms is listed radiant is listed ags is listed bankers keep coming to us all the time saying why don't you list and uh, you know uh, there is a reason for us to also believe that unlocking value time wise it's the right thing to do for our shareholders So all put together, I think that's that's how the thinking is. Mm. So that's fine. And another question: Like, is there any plan, especially in the cash uh, logistics, to move to retail cash management, or any sort of uh, different divisions, just apart from the ATM? And do you have any plans of that sort? So, so uh, SIS uh, is the third largest retail cash management company in the country already. Mm. so we we do atm services we do door step banking or cash pick up delivery or retail cash management whatever name you call it we do that we do cash in transit services we do bullion management services we are a full suite cash logistics company there is nothing that we don't do the difference is radiant is 80% de- dependent on retail cash management uh CMS is 80% dependent on uh, ATM. In our case, it's a different mix. You know, it's 20% ATMs, another 40% CIT. That's 60% in total, and then 30% retail cash management, and 10% value-added services from bullion management to outsourcing currency chests of banks, which most other companies don't have capability to do. banks are outsourcing their entire currency chest operation with machines with space with people for sis to run 
Thank you. Thank you. Participants may press star and one to ask a question. As there are no further questions from the participants, I now hand the conference over to Mr. Raturat Sena for closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining this call and uh, taking so much interest in SIS. I think it's been an eventful quarter uh, for SIS uh, in terms of results for the first time. SIS has registered 150 crore plus EBITDA in its journey. Uh, I believe that uh, as the facility management business comes along in the coming quarters, we overall, as we had committed, the overall margin trajectory uh, of SIS will also move towards the 6%. We had stated at the beginning of the year that this year is completely dedicated to margin focus and the results of that are clearly evident in the trend lines of the last four quarters. I think that not just the margins, uh, if you look at giving back to shareholders also, we can completed our third successive buyback in the last three years, in the three buybacks, we've given it back more than 300 crores to our shareholders. So obviously we are a cash generating company and we are regularly distributing cash back to shareholders. This was our third buyback, which was successfully completed. And last but not the least, I think the, the idea to list the cash joint venture with Prosegor will definitely unlock thousand to fifteen hundred crores of value for our existing shareholders and we are going to try and get this deal done at the earliest uh, hopefully the picture will be clearer post elections but we are going to try and get it done in a in a quick way uh, and hopefully uh, deliver good value to our shareholders in financial year 25 thank you very much once again for following the SIS journey and uh, if you need any further information, please feel free to get in touch with Vineet or Shweta uh, or in the investor relations team. They will anyway be in Mumbai to take on meetings. Uh, so please feel free. Thank you very much once again. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. On behalf of SIS Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines.